people first organizations will win in the future of work. Your only real asset is your people. We, we all, all want, want purpose driven work. work. HR led organization is. I'm the sorry, but leaders don't lead empty desks and empty shop floors. Welcome to the People Strategy Leaders Show. I'm your host, Sri Chalapa, founder and president of Engagedly, and a serial entrepreneur in technology, films, and music. This is where we talk to people leaders, business strategists, and organizational savants about leading in the time of change. What is working, what is not working, and more importantly, what we should be thinking about. Stick around to the end of the show. We will reveal how you can be our next guest. And now, let's engage. Hello, this is Sri Chalapa again with People Strategy Leaders Podcast, and we are back after a two-month hiatus that I took because I was traveling all over the world, and I wanted to uh, take that break. And we are joined today by Coach Ram, who actually is a, a very seasoned executive and the latest uh, winner or the nominee of the LinkedIn Top Voices. So. Coach Ram, who, whose real name is Ramakrishna Rao, is a seasoned learning and organizational development leader with more than 16 years of experience in IT, ITES, retail, and consumer product sectors. He's currently a chief learning officer for Page Industries, which is also known as Jockey India, uh, uh, who are familiar with the, with the brand Jockey. Being a certified and practicing coach, he is also known as Coach Ram in the social circuit. He blogs regularly on LinkedIn, is known for his insightful posts and book summaries on personal effectiveness, talent management, leadership development, and career building. His newsletter, Career Trek on LinkedIn, is one of the most followed ones. And as I mentioned earlier, he's one of the LinkedIn top voices for careers for 2023. Well, welcome to the show, Coach Ram. It's an honor to have you. Absolute pleasure. Thank you, Shri, for having me. And look forward to our conversation. Well, thank you so much. And obviously, we are sp speaking across the globe. I'm here in St. Louis. You're back in India, so it must be late for you. So I really appreciate you making the time here. Um, you now, you were also one of the top uh, HR influencers that Engagedly put out, I believe, a year or so ago. So I recognize your name from that. Uh, so I'm really excited to have this conversation with you. Um, because one of the things that you're focusing on is learning and development, right? For organizations and in leadership development, developing people, but developing organizations in general, um, especially with all these changes that are happening in the market uh, with AI and fluid teams and fluid workplace cultures, you know, learning becomes even more imperative than ever before. So I'm gonna start off with the first question. You know, you, you know when you talk about a learning culture, you know, one of the things you were talking about earlier was not just learning culture at the individual level, but learning culture at the organization level. Can you explain what you mean by that? Okay, so I, I draw inspiration from um, uh, Peter Singe's uh, fifth discipline model, uh, where he talks about uh, a learning organization. And uh, my endeavor uh, with all the organizations that I have worked with is to build them uh, towards becoming learning organizations. Now, what does what what does a learning organization mean? Um, it's uh, and uh, the famous quote goes saying, you know, uh, the organizations which are going to thrive um, in the current times, the uncertain times, the VUCA, bunny, all of those times, is the organizations that can reinvent themselves and you know quickly adapt uh, to the needs. And we keep hearing about uh, organizations that have been at the um, uh, top of the ladder, having a great market share, uh, and suddenly nose diving uh, when they are not able to reinvent themselves, like the uh, Nokia's of the world. And you know we have many many examples like that. So uh, the biggest differentiator for an organization to thrive uh, for decades and longer, uh, and that X factor and that edge. Uh, is uh, the organization being a learning organization, right? And uh, there are multiple ways to uh, accomplish that. Uh, it's not about individuals uh, learning for their own good and therefore their own, own self-development, but it's a, it's a culture where uh, everyone in the organization is open to learning from each other, uh, agile, uh, challenging the status quo, and uh, constantly feeding off each other where innovation is a way of life and that's how the best product comes out and you know the best of the customer experiences get created 
uh, and a bedrock of foundation of all of this is that culture of you know continuous learning that attitude of continuous learning when that becomes a dna then uh, the rest of it becomes uh, an outcome so yeah so so you know learning organization seems like it would be very hard to build if you didn't have some seeds uh at least at the leadership level to drive that because you're not talking about learning at the individual level right you can have individuals who are learning and most individuals are learning one way or the other to some extent now a learning organization becomes a learning organization because multiple individuals and most of the individuals in the organizations are learning together towards a common purpose right so i'm not learning about one thing here another person is learning about something here which actually has no bearing on the organization's future so how do you align people on that learning in that from what you've seen in your own experience and how have you done it yeah so uh and again i again go back to uh, peter singer's framework where you know he talks about uh, the first pillar uh, is about having a shared vision uh, shared vision and engaged employees where employees are uh, emotionally invested in the shared vision of the organization it's not about you know a particular target or you know a revenue number that one is looking at but something which is larger uh, in terms of how the organization is contributing and you know how uh, individuals or employees relate to the purpose of that uh, organization then engagement becomes um, engagement is a default you know uh, outcome of sorts um, so having a shared vision uh and when that shared vision happens then you are no longer uh, working for your own self you are not working in silos you are not working for your kras you are not working for you know accomplishing your functions goals or anything you are you have that org picture uh, always uh, in your mind and when that big picture is there then the alignment becomes far easy in most of the organization what you see is uh you'll have functional leaders uh who are uh you know heroes in their own right right they are, they have fantastic potential they would have done great things in the previous organizations in the current organization as well but um it is oasis of excellence you mm-hmm. have people working in uh, working in silos doing stuff on their own and you have islands of you know uh, excellence uh, everywhere right but how can they come together and work towards you know the larger purpose of the organization for that to happen uh, those silos need to be broken and the way you break those silos is uh, having a buy in for that collective vision when that shared vision happens then everyone is thinking about a larger picture beyond beyond their kra beyond their function success and uh, more aligned towards organization success when yeah. that happens when that happens you are ready to be challenged by others right so you will have um, you you will have say a quality function being challenged by operations and you know uh, marketing challenged by uh, you know sales right in terms of challenging the thought process challenging the ways of working otherwise everyone is uh, working on their own paths and uh, you won't have that knowledge sharing happening and you won't have that challenging happening when that does not happen collaboration uh, takes a nose dive and you are fending for yourself all the time right yeah. so yeah. in in my view foundation is uh, that alignment with the larger purpose and uh, you know shared vision where uh, learning from each other can you know become a way of life yeah so the shared vision obviously so i have two questions on that obviously who sets that shared vision and how do you drive that vision across all your different you know levels of management and business units and departments and second i would say that a precursor to having that challenge that you talked about is having some level of psychological safety in your workplace as well where you feel it's a okay to challenge another another person without you know making them angry or or upset but also it's okay to be challenged because you don't want to necessarily you need to be in the position where you feel like it's it's okay to be wrong because you are looking for a better a bigger purpose and, and and you can change your own approach and and you don't feel ashamed because you're wrong you're actually thankful that you're wrong because now you actually can do the right thing 
So how do you build so, that aspect as well? So that was, I guess, is my second comment on that. A, a lot of cultural elements come into play here. You know, you, you spoke about psychological safety. Uh, you spoke about, you know, uh, embracing uh, experimentation, right? Uh, celebrating failures, uh, the growth mindset. All of these sort of come together uh, only when you have the right uh, leadership, encouraging, encouraging those things. And, and also uh, when it comes to say in terms of uh, performance management, I've seen, I've seen many a times performance management actually kills collaboration in the organization. Because you know, the way you design the goals, the way you uh, set objectives, if they are in very, very functional silos, everyone is going about their work. And you're not really encouraging people to think beyond their roles. Because people work with their uh, KRAs and you know what I get measured on is what I focus on. And if I get measured on only uh, achieving my functional objectives, why would I anyway think of you know doing something larger? Yes. Right. So what do we encourage? Uh, if I if I have great ideas about uh, another function, uh, I want to contribute. I have the big picture. Uh, I want to think uh, beyond my function. But is it really encouraged in the organization? Um, is that is that rewarded, appreciated? Uh, when you do that, um, you know, then that's the way you break those uh, functional silos. I'm encouraged to think beyond. I'm encouraged to uh, make mistakes. I'm encouraged to uh, take bets, take risks, fail, uh, fail fast, learn fast, and we collectively uh, we are able to do that together. So yeah. a lot of a lot of these cultural aspects sort of uh, come into play. What am I appreciated for? What am I, uh, you know, rewarded for? That behavior thought sort of tends to uh, rub off on each other. And uh, if as if I take risks, uh, you know, some of those risks, many of those risks may not take off. Some risks uh, take off, uh, and we get success. Uh, then that sort of becomes uh, a way of life. Right. So in your experience, and, and, we, have seen, and, and we have seen in many, uh, in many large organizations, uh, the Googles of the world, the Microsofts of the world, etc. Uh, you'll, you'll see a lot of projects that uh, don't see light of the day. Uh, but essentially those uh, out of 100 projects, probably there may be one or two, which suddenly become uh, you know, an overnight success but uh, we'll never get to see the 98 that never made the right of the day. Uh, but if their culture of experimentation is not there, uh, the one out of 100 will never happen. Correct, correct. And that's how you get people to think outside the box and come up with new ideas and, and learn and grow uh, in the process of doing that. Um, so what approach have you taken? Have you, can you give us an, an anecdote or a, or a story of how you have driven that uh, in the past with any of your organizations you've been part of? Yeah, so uh, a very interesting uh, scenario in terms of how uh, sales works. You know, I, I was part of uh, an apparel uh, uh, retail organization and, you know, we come up with new products, um, you know, every season. And uh, there's a huge uh, sales workforce on the ground. Um, we sort of need to be trained on, you know, uh, what to talk about the product, how do you pitch the product to the customers, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, we, uh, the method that we had was that, you know, we will create some training material and we will send it out to all the stores and people will go through those training material and, you know, sort of perform on the job. We, twi we twisted it slightly. Uh, instead of a top-down approach, we used a bottoms-up approach. We said, here is the basic information. You take the basic information and uh, we took inspiration from uh, social media and we said, uh, whoever can come up with the best uh, pitch, uh, you know, for uh, selling this product, make a video and put it up on the portal. And, you know, uh, a lot of crowdsourced uh, content uh, from an employee sourced content that sort of came up and uh, the best of the lot, uh, you know, got uh, more like, more recognized. And those became uh, examples. And uh, believe me, if I if I pick the top five, uh, you know, sales videos that came up, those are real live pitches. Uh, 
no one sitting in the head office uh, would have even thought of it. Mm-hmm. That, that's the kind of innovation that came through, right? So, and that happened uh, because we allowed you know thousands of videos to get uploaded. Out of that, maybe uh, five videos you know became the cream, right? So there again, you gave ownership uh, for people. Uh, you allowed people to try. You allowed people to uh, fail. And the best automatically sort of uh, emerged out of the system. So yeah. that, that I see, I've seen uh, as a, a great example where, you know, the collective uh, excellence uh, sort of came through the ranks. Yeah, right. yeah. And I think too often organization leaders don't give, don't trust their employees to come up with the ideas. You know, I think that's where they fail because they're like, oh, if I let this person who's two or three levels down, take charge of coming up with an idea it's gonna suck and i i should make a decision anyway um so there's a level of uh, so one more example i can think of uh we spent tons of uh you know we put in tons of resources money into say consumer research yes uh you know where you hire you know consultants to sort of do focus group discussions and come out with insights uh regarding what your customers want so on and so forth uh the biggest, uh, the biggest experience, the biggest, uh, the largest wisdom pool is available with you, your own employees, uh, who are engaging with uh, customers, you know, day in day out. Even the best of the uh, consultants would probably uh, engage with about uh, thousand thousand customers through various focus group discussions, so on and so forth. But if you look at those thousand customers is something that uh, your workforce, your field workforce is engaging with in a single day. And they they have the power to, uh, they can give you far more powerful insights than what, you know, um, an external consultant can give you. Uh, but it's about creating a platform for them to share, uh, creating those avenues. And um, uh, once you, once the channels are in place, you make the right uh noises uh celebrate the right behaviors and a lot of uh data flows for you uh yes. so so yeah. that, that's another example where i have seen you know bottoms up uh communications uh really work when you you know set up the right uh when you set it up the right way yeah yeah that's 100 percent right you know i i was reading this article the other day and i'm also you know also a ceo of my company and i and I, and, I, and I look like, I don't know if I have the answer for this, but usually the answer is in the room. If you just ask your people, people in the front lines, you know, people in the front lines is important. Have that frontline obsession is one of the key success areas that I was reading about what makes companies successful is you have that frontline obsession, obsession you know. Um, people like uh, the Oberais who built that big hotel chain, you know, even in his 80s or whatever, he would go and talk to the waiter or the front desk receptionist to understand how people were uh, getting treated and what the challenges they were facing um, in running a, a successful operation within the hotels. So that yeah, is so what... one of my one of my mentors uh, calls it, uh, you know, uh, having the antennas and sensors on, right? So different ways ways and means uh, in which you can get the insight from, you know, the customer, the end user. And if you have your sensors and antennas on, then you have uh, lots of data that's you know flowing into you, and not yes. just you know a group of advisors or a group of your direct reports who say yes to every brain wave that you have. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. You want to get out of your comfort zone in that sense. Um, so, last question um, at a broad level. So, I guess it's a series of questions, probably. But the last set of questions is really around the AI. You know, AI obviously can augment now, and I don't have to remember and know everything. I can ask the AI, you know, ChatGPT and other types of language models out there that can be leveraged to learn quickly, know the answer quickly. How do you think the impact of that will be on learning and development for organizations uh, as you look out? So if I if I see uh, even the generative AI, uh, the latest one which is making waves, uh, it's it's a lot about uh, knowledge base, right? So a lot of uh, a lot of knowledge uh, acquisition 
uh, which is which was there uh, part of a learning process uh, is no longer required right so i no longer remember uh, i i no longer uh, look at uh, the roots uh, if i have to go from a to b i don't rely on my memory in terms of where i should take left where i should take right i use maps right uh, so the need for me to uh, remember the uh, route is gone. In the same way, if I want to know about a particular product, uh, instead of memorizing information about the product, uh, I'll rather look up for information rather than you know feed all that information into myself. So anything which is knowledge-based, uh, process-based, anything which is centered around uh, memory and more cognitive in nature, uh, that's something that I can easily outsource to an AI system. Right. What is what is important for me uh, is more the behavioral aspects, more the attitudinal aspects. Right. So from a learning point of view, it is those uh, behaviors and skills uh, that I'll focus a lot more on, uh, rather than investing you know time and energy in terms of uh, training people or anyone uh, around the knowledge aspects. So uh, leverage AI, um, use it. Uh, it's a it's a next version of a Google search. Um, you know, it probably gives you uh, information on fingertips. Uh, use it perfectly well, but uh, the human capability moves to a higher order. Um, from a uh, memory information to a um, skill and a behavior. Yeah, yeah. You know, one of the things we've seen from a learning and developer perspective is now it can suggest type of training based on your behaviors. So you can actually be, you, can, you don't have to think about where do I get the best training for how to, you know, do a certain thing or how to learn. Maybe if you're a new salesperson, you know, how do you learn to position your product properly? It can suggest based on your own behavior, where your skill gaps might be, and also based on your cohort of other people. Um, so those are some of the technologies, you know, we've been looking at in Engagely as well. Um, so I feel like the, the yeah, learning so it's side a uh, from that point of view, it's a hyper-personalized uh, learning path. Um, uh, it's not a one-size-fits-all, you know, uh, vanilla approach in terms of everyone goes through these set of trainings. Yes. Uh, everyone's yes. start point is different. Everyone's uh, experience is different. So uh, the system can sort of sense uh, where you are and what you need and uh, give you only what you need uh, instead of, you know, boring you to death on you know everything which is part of a package of sort so hyper personalized learning i think that's part of uh, uh, ai has been part of lxps but i think it will still uh, further evolve um, and gives you a lot of uh, analytics uh, so if if i'm currently using a learning ecosystem uh, for my group of employees and i want to identify uh, high potentials um, I don't need to really do another assessment center or you know development center for me to figure out who has more potential. Uh, I have tons of data, tons of insights uh, on people's behavior, uh, learning, uh, learning indices, and how they have learned over the last you know one year. If I look at data, that data itself it tells me um, you know various aspects. Instead of assessing uh, people through a development center, uh, you know with a couple of case studies and one exercise of sorts, I'm looking at one year's uh, you know, track record in terms of their behaviors I've demonstrated. That's a far mm -hmm. better indicator than what an assessment center would tell me. So yeah. uh, even in terms of identifying potential, I see a lot of use cases where uh, AI can really play a role. Identifying potential, how do you, how would you go about doing that? Can you maybe elaborate a little bit? Well, so uh, if I'm looking at learning agility as uh, one of the components, uh, I am identifying high potentials and uh, learning agility is one, resilience is one, uh, one of the components. Um, and what are the ways in which uh, I can test it? Uh, in the current methodology, what do you, you know, you'll probably give few exercises, case studies, presentations, ask them to um, uh, perform on that particular day. And you'll have uh, maybe an assessors or even a you know a virtual uh, assessment center which sort of identifies what behaviors have demonstrated. Vis-a-vis, -vis, if I'm looking at uh, last one year's data, and I'm looking at okay, what are the uh, 
the user had uh, various uh, courses at their disposal. You know, how did they go about choosing? Uh, how consistent have they been in terms of you know picking up courses, completing courses? Um, if I look at, uh, uh, you know, I've launched uh, LinkedIn Learning at some of my uh, organizations, and I see a tendency in terms of uh, uh, patterns, in terms of how users come up. Uh, there may be a user who, you know, uh, opens some, starts some 200 courses and completes just one or two courses. There is a guy who picks up uh, five courses, but sees through those five courses. Right. Uh, there is someone who uh, demonstrates uh, high intensity on uh, in in probably one week, then goes completely low for four five weeks, and then uh, suddenly there is a high trend uh, interest level. Vis a vis, there's another guy who is investing 30 minutes every day consistently across. So uh, these are behaviors that you can uh, pick up, uh, and these are behaviors demonstrated in a non-supervised uh, uh, environment, and there right. are and, and they are themselves in those environments. That's a far better indicator than what uh, someone would be in an assessment center where I know that every move of mine is being watched and let me demonstrate and let me be my best self. Yeah. Right? So assessing people uh, when they are their best self, vis-a-vis -vis assessing people when they are their, uh, when they are their authentic self. I think uh, there's a lot of potential in, uh, in you know, understanding people better. Uh, and you know the insights that uh, AI can capture um, by through the data mining, all of the sorts can uh, throw up a lot of insights on what uh, what behaviors and traits are people demonstrating, uh, whether it's a learning platform or a sales platform that they use, any of those. Okay, so um, the last question, I promise, is the last one, <laughs> the last last one. Uh, if I was a new learning and development leader in an organization, you know, what tip would you give give them? And when, if their goal is to build a learning organization in their organization, like what are the, you know, top one, two, three things or steps they should take? One, not to have an agenda. Uh, it's very tempting for any uh, learning leader to go and say, "This is what I want to do um, in this organization." So. Uh, avoid the temptation of having an agenda. The agenda should be uh, articulated and uh, driven by the business leader, not by the uh, L&D leader. So not having an agenda. B, uh, focus more on uh, culture building rather than short wins, right? It's not about launching, you know, high visible, high visibility campaigns, um, but about building culture uh, brick by brick. Uh, creating a full environment for uh, learning rather than pushing, you know, courses or programs or flagship programs, so on and so forth. Um, focus on uh, impact more than uh, marketability or saleability. That's that's how you, uh, you know, there may be some four or five uh, big bank programs that you launch and there's a lot of, you make a lot of noise around it. Uh, people say, wow, something great is happening. Uh, but a year down the line, people say, oh, okay, there's, there's a lot of noise, but uh, we haven't seen much change. Right. So focus on building culture of learning, uh, building culture of peer learning, uh, learning in the flow of work uh, rather than, you know, event-based uh, learning, right? When learning is in the flow of work, then uh, you don't need to really uh, pull people out for learning. People are learning on the job, in the flow. They're mm -hmm. learning what they need for themselves. You're only providing platform opportunities, uh, so on and so forth. And that's what I said, create a pull-based environment rather than a push-based, uh, you know, a program-driven approach. Great. Well, thanks a lot, Coach Ram. It's been very insightful. I think learning organizations are more needed than ever before because things are changing so fast. If you're not learning, you're decaying very, very quickly as an organization and as an individual as well. So um, thank you for your insight. Now, where can people uh, reach out to you and read about uh, your thoughts? Oh, I'm, I, uh, I blog most frequently on LinkedIn uh, almost every day. So you can look up uh, Coach Ram on LinkedIn and um, 
sign up for my uh, newsletter, which goes by the name uh, Career Trek. Uh, you will find it in my on my profile. Uh, so I blog. Uh, I send out one newsletter every week, where uh, I talk about uh, key key skills, traits, uh, tips, hacks on how do you uh, move ahead uh, in our own uh, career journey. And uh, so look forward to connecting with uh, all of you there and uh, uh, we can engage and stay connected on the platform. Excellent. Well, thank you, Coach Sam. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Srikant. Shri Chalapa here. Thank you so much for listening to the People Strategy Leaders Podcast. If you are a successful leader, or a people strategist who would like to be on this program, please visit engagedly.com slash people strategy leaders podcast. If you got something out of this interview, would you share this episode on social media? If you know someone that would be a great guest, tag them on social media to let them know about the show and include the hashtag people strategy leaders. I love seeing your posts and guest suggestions. We are regularly putting out new episodes and content. To make sure you don't miss any episodes, go ahead and subscribe. Your thumbs up, ratings, and reviews go a long way to help promote the show and mean a lot to me and my team. Want to know more? Follow me on LinkedIn and Twitter at Sri Chalapa. Thanks for listening. We will see you next time. And thank you to Patrick Ramsey, sound engineer at Kalinga Production Studios for recording and mixing this show.